Welcome to Plant Medicine Transmissions with Javier Regueiro. I would like to begin this podcast on shamanism by reading from the book The Feather Sun by Friedrich Schuhon, published by World Wisdom Books. Friedrich Schuhon was one of the main advocates of the perennial philosophy uh, late last century and uh, had become dear friend of several Red Indians communities. The word shamanism is used here to mean the traditions of prehistoric origin that are associated with Mongoloid peoples, including the American Indians. In Asia, shamanism, properly so called, is met not only in Siberia, but also in Tibet, in the form of Bon Po, and in Mongolia, Manchuria, and Korea. The pre-Buddhist Chinese tradition, with its Confucian and Taoist branches, is attached to the same traditional family. And the same applies to Japan, where shamanism has given rise to the specifically Japanese Shinto tradition. Characteristic of all these doctrines is a complementary opposition of heaven and earth, and a cult of nature, the latter being envisaged under the aspect of his essential causality and not of his existential accidentality. They are also distinguished by a certain parsimony in their eschatology, very apparent in Confucianism, and above all by the central function of the shaman, assumed in China by the Tao Tse and in Tibet by the lamas concerned with divination and exorcism. I will continue by saying that I am not fond of the word shaman as it used today by Western people. I feel that the word shaman comes with a lot of expectations and a certain degree of idealization, which I don't think is really helpful whenever we engage with someone who claims to be a shaman. Therefore, I prefer to call myself a plant medicine person stressing the, for me, most important part of the figure and the role of the shaman, which is not that of fancy flights into other dimensions and performing miracles and healings, but most importantly, its aspect as a doctor. A doctor that, since this tradition comes from a place where there is no split between mind and spirit, is therefore a doctoring on all levels of our beings and does not limit itself to physical ailments or physical remedies, but acknowledges and honors the totality of our being, and in particular, the fact that essentially we are spiritual beings having a material experience. Nowadays, there are countless neo-shamanic practices and disciplines that have seen the light of day. Among them all, there seems to be a common thread, and that is a closer reconnection to nature, to all aspects of nature. And I personally feel that all of this is very beneficial because as modern people, our first and deepest disconnection is with 
the earth and with nature, not to mention our disconnection from our physical bodies. So any form of shamanic practice, including that of shamanic plant medicines, can truly support us in reconnecting with nature, in reconnecting with our bodies, and reconnection with the land that we live on. The level of disconnection and the resulting anxiety from disconnected from nature is what gives rise to most neurosis in modern people. The challenge is not to find new theories, new ideas in order to reconnect us with nature, but it's about practicing, practicing in very simple ways, in very humble ways. I have mentioned in previous episodes my practice of offering despachos, of offering offerings to the earth and the mountains of this valley. This is a very simple practice, but very profound in that it acknowledges the fact that our well-being depends not only on our own self and efforts, but on everything that surrounds us. It brings us to a place of humility and of realizing that we are not the creator of the air we breathe, of most of the food that we ingest, of the water that we drink, and that our health, physical and non-physical, depends upon all of this that surrounds us. Shamanic practices, for me, are most importantly about going into alignment with these natural forces instead of trying to control them or instead of simply resenting them. My own personal journey has brought me to a place of recognizing full-on the benevolence of nature, of no longer projecting my own fears onto nature, of letting go of those projections. And finally, nature has appeared to me in its full glory and benevolence, so much so that I have no interest for the time being in being anywhere else. When I look around only just our solar system, I'm like, this is this place where I live is so privileged among all other planets of just this solar system. And it doesn't look like beyond our solar system there are that many places that are as blessed, as generous, and as benevolent as this planet Earth. The process of letting go of our fears, our distrust of the natural environment is not that easy because underneath it is a distrust, first of all, in ourselves. It's about the identification that we hold in regards to who we are. Most of us identify simply with our physical bodies and little else. When we identify with our physical bodies through the action of our ego, what happens is that we contract. We are indeed just a speck of dust under this uh, way of looking at things. 
and the more we identify with our physical bodies, the bigger the universe appears and the more easily it is to feel scared and at times overwhelmed by the universe that surrounds us and about which we have absolutely no control, no matter what our minds tell us. For all of us who live in an urban environment, there is always a longing for a return to nature. A return to nature that in uh, recent centuries has been romanticized by this or that author. And it's an attitude, that romantic attitude, of a paradise lost. When in reality, nature surrounds us and is within us all the time. So it's not necessarily about going trekking around the Himalaya or burying oneself under a mount of dirt that will reconnect us with the earth. What we can do is very simple steps in our daily lives in order to acknowledge that connection, that communion, and that being part of this world. For me, one of the simplest practices is whenever I have a meal, depending on the situation, sometimes I say this silently, sometimes more openly, I give thanks, I give grace to each and every one of my meals by acknowledging all the energies that are responsible in their own way for bringing this food to my table. So it's a very short prayer where I acknowledge everything. I acknowledge the people who prepared or made sure that I could buy and prepare this food. I say thanks to all the animals, the plants, the rivers, the oceans, the snows and the rains, the winds and the clouds, the sun, the moon, and all of the stars. And in doing so, there is a very simple lessening of our egos. Nowadays, provided that we have the money to pay for these foods, then uh, we only thank ourselves and our efforts, professional and otherwise, that make it so that we can afford these foods. But this is a lie, or rather, a very limited way of looking at things and very egocentric. Because as I've said before, we don't really make the food that we eat. And most importantly, among those foods, we don't make the air we breathe and we don't make the water that we drink. And these are our most important sources of food. By acknowledging that we are not the sole responsible factors in the food that we ingest and nourish us is a lessening of the ego, a lessening of self-importance. And this is a wonderful step of not only reconnecting with nature in positive and grateful ways, but also of lessening the claims of our egos. Such prayers before every meal also remind us in very simple ways of the interconnectedness of everything. 
thus lessening that sense of separation and of alienation from our natural surroundings. In past times, particularly before the birth of the mercantile civilization and of the Industrial Revolution, our livelihood was so strictly dependent on nature that nature was worshipped and honored and celebrated, particularly at time of harvest and of seeding our fields or during hunting seasons. And those celebrations would put us in touch in uh, positive ways with the cycles of nature. A beautiful thing that has happened in recent years with the birth of, once again, farmers markets and the invitation to buy locally. By buying locally as much as possible, we are actually connecting with the rhythms of the earth that we live upon. And it's always a good idea to buy produce when they are in season, rather than importing them from the other side of the world so that we can have our mangoes all year round, so to speak. In the shift from uh, traditional societies and uh, the modern world, what has happened is also a degradation, a distortion of what shamanism really is about, at least in my opinion. If in ancient times the work of the shaman and the community was to be in harmony, in intimate relationship with nature, what has happened is that we have turned shamanism into a way of controlling our environment. And that is an attitude that is not only related to shamanism, but to most spiritual traditions, religions. We keep quoting the Bible to justify the fact that nature is for our own use and for our own control. When the reality and the recent and increasing natural disasters tell us that we are not in control of nature. It is an illusion and uh, even though with technologies we can change here and there, most of the changes that we have implemented upon our natural environment have disastrous consequences. The great shaman is not the one who can change the weather at will. He is the one who knows intimately the rhythms and the workings of nature and aligns himself and takes along the whole community in order to be in a harmonious relationship with nature and not in conflict and not with a desire to change it because it is a knowledge that nature provides for us everything that we need. Maybe not every day of the year. There may be times of scarcity, like in the winter. There may be droughts, all of that. But still, all of this is part of a greater cycle and of a perfect cycle of harmony in between all aspects of natural creation. Blessings.